Good morning. Um, the reading today comes from John chapter 4, verses 1 through to 42. So it's a long one, I'm afraid. And it's in the Bible, Church Bible on 1066. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was but Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town called Samaria, called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, it was about the sixth hour. When, the Samaritan, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for the drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has, and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say, four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows another and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. 
So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed for two more days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard out for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the saviour of the world. Thanks be to God. This is his word. Amen. Bob, Bob to come up. Thank you, Joy. That was beautifully read. Thank you. Okay. Let's just all, uh, all pray for, for Bob. Thank you. Yeah. Father, just thank you for your servant, Bob. Thank you for the work that he's done in preparing for this talk this morning. And Lord, as he speaks your words, would they yeah. just be water to our souls, yeah. uh, changing our lives by your spirit? Yeah. And would they also be a blessing to him? Yeah. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. During the three and a half years ministry, earthly ministry of Jesus, he encountered people, humanity, Multitudes, groups, high and low, religious and non-religious, on other religions. And uh, here we have a lovely example um, of an individual, a woman. We can learn a lot from those encounters, whether it be individuals or groups, whether the subject is focused really on religion or, or just society in general, we can learn because we are actually in those situations as individuals today. As we said through the, one of the songs we sang, he is here today. His love is for us today. Now, this uh, lady... This woman, she has a bit of history and she is uh, uh, obviously uh, starts out her life as a Samaritan. And uh, we hear that the encounter begins that Jesus was going hurriedly back to Galilee And uh, if you look at the map, of course, you'll see that Judea is here, Samaria, and Galilee. And Jews would not go through Samaria. They disliked, in fact, hated the Samaritans. And so they wouldn't go through that country. They'd go across to the other, to the east side, over the River Jordan, straight up and round, many more miles. Roughly these, these three counties, if you like, are roughly 60 miles uh, high, roughly, and about 30 uh, wide. So you, you see, it meant that they had a lot more journey to, to do. But Jesus went directly. And if you look at the map, the town that he came to is roughly in the middle. And uh, we are told that... Uh, He had to go through Samaria. The need to go through Samaria was not merely a geographical one. It was a consideration with a divine compulsion. So he comes to a town (coughs) called Sychar in Samaria near the plot of ground of Jacob who had given who had given to his son Joseph. If you go back to the Old Testament, right, at those those times, Jacob actually bought a a huge swathe of ground and it was still there and uh, maintained. There was a lot of history going on at this time. And uh, so we come to this uh, situation where Jesus is... uh, He was tired from his journey, 
Isn't that wonderful? How human we see at times snapshots of Jesus' humanity. He knows what we're like. He knows how tired we can be. And so he sits down at the well. This is all prearranged by him, of course. He's omniscient. But along comes this lady. The time was about the sixth hour. Now, in Jewish uh, timing, this was the day started at 6 a.m., so this would be 12 o'clock, midday. Now, this was very, very hot time. We've recently experienced hot weather, haven't we? And you can imagine. And so this, there was Jesus sat by the well, waiting for his friends, of course, and along comes this woman at that time of the day with her container, whatever it was, for water. Now, of course, the everyday people had to go and get their water, and mainly early in the morning, which was much better, it was much cooler, the women would go in groups, in a group, and they would go and get the water, and it was a social occasion. They joined together. Women like to be together shopping, don't they, etc. She ought to have been with them. Why wasn't she? Well, we find out, don't we, in the narrative that follows. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, and it's a lovely introduction, this really, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew. It's interesting she recognized him as a Jew. You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate, it, associate with Samaritans. By this time, the Samaritans were considered foreigners. The original inhabitants of Samaria had been taken away in 722, 722 years earlier taken away by Sargon, ruler of Assyria. There was a remnant left, as there always is, and and, and with the exile there was as well. But this remnant kind of made a, a national identity of their own. But there was many other people joined them, came as immigrants, Babylonians and all sorts. So there was a real mixture of foreigners there. And that's what the Jews didn't like. But from this influence, there was a religious side to it. And now idolatry had persisted and triumphed. They regarded only the Pentateuch, that's Genesis to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books, they only regarded that as authoritative, as authoritative and looked forward to the return of Moses. However, by this time, the New Testament times, they were more in line, it has to be say, said, and they were urging to get, to get to, with the Orthodox Old Testament beliefs. But still, the Jews would not recognize them and would not allow them to come into Jerusalem and into the temple particularly. They were forbidden. They were outcasts. They were foreigners. We don't agree. And to some extent, they were focusing on what they were rather than what they had become, the Samaritans. If we get back to the conversation between this woman and Jesus, Jesus answered her when she, when she responded to the request for a drink about not associating with him, with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, and this is so interesting. She has said, we do not... Uh, associate you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan and what was his answer if you knew he said to her 
the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. I think we heard a quote from chapter 7 a little bit earlier about living water. And that's what he's saying. Even though she may not have fully understood, he was offering that, and I'm sure she did eventually. Sir, the woman said, that's interesting, isn't it? Her attitude is suddenly beginning to change. You have nothing to drink. You have nothing to draw with, with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? It's a very human reaction, isn't it? You're talking about water. You haven't even got something to draw from. Where is this, li- this living water? The key word is living, actually, of course. Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herbs, herds? She's focusing on the actual practical side of water. And don't we, too. I think I've drunk more water in the last six weeks than I've ever done in the last couple of years, if you like. We know we, we understand her attitude. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. So I'm not talking about, is almost saying to her, about the actual fact of water here, as good as it is. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will, will become in him a spring of water, welling up t- to eternal life. Wow, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water. And then she adds, So that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. There's a touch of sarcasm there, isn't there? Because he's talking about great spiritual things. He told her, Suddenly he changes the conversation. Go call your husband and come back. He knows. He's omniscient, of course. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said, just said is quite true. How profound. She's a little bit stunned about this and raises a really a bit of a religious argument. Sir, the woman said, I can see you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. She's trying to avoid the discussion. The mountain, this mountain refers... Sorry, I'll go through to the verse 21. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. This mountain refers to Mount Gerizim on which the Samaritans built a temple as a rival place of worship since they were not welcome in the Jerusalem temple. Jesus is saying about places of sanctuary, places of worship. And he declares, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. This is interesting, isn't it? You you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. We have a sanctuary. We have to have it. It's wonderful. It's good. It's right and proper. 
but we don't come here to worship the building or religion or even perhaps each other. Initially, we come to worship in the Spirit as we've sung in the Holy Spirit and that brings truth. The Spirit and truth. You know, friends, I guess lots of us have been going here and there recently and will be going and doing. Isn't it wonderful that wherever we are, we can worship him in his spirit. We can embrace and have the spirit. He belongs to give us the spirit. And the spirit brings truth. I don't want to be a, a religious person. I want to be truthful sometimes I find it difficult but he helps and I know I can always go to him and talk about that subject God, God is spirit this is on to the end of the last piece where, we said, where he said the father uh, the, the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. That's God's words. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman now is being challenged. The woman said, I know the Messiah he called Christ. Now she's She's opening up or encouraging a subject here. She's saying, and I guess she's suspecting that she's standing before somebody quite different to an ordinary human being. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. It's a leading statement. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Meanwhile, the disciples um, were returning and uh, they were surprised to find him talking with, with a woman and a Samaritan at that. The disciples, the 12 disciples. We as Christians and those believers as Christians need to be inclusive, not exclusive. It's right and proper that we take care and love each other. The Lord commands that, but it doesn't end just here. And with us, friends and love people who believe and share together is wonderful all the activities are fantastic this place is wonderful but it doesn't end here by no means it's with us when we go out of those doors and wherever we go to our homes to our workplaces to our schools and colleges wherever we are that's where we encounter people like the Samaritan woman she had a different view of religion. She had a very colourful past, which was there in front. And what did Jesus do? Did he lecture her about morality? Or The word, of course, does. But he embraced her. And we should do what the Lord does, shouldn't we? And I find, friends, that it's not an easy path by no means, especially when you see all the news and all the things that are going on with or without religion. It's not easy. But I believe it with all my heart that as we change our attitude, as we change our, our thoughts and our own uh, reckonings about other people and other individuals, other groups, other nationalities, whoever they are, they're people created in the image of God him we, I and we should bear always that in mind all people we should respect 
and we should indeed seek the best for them in whatever way we can, whoever they are, whoever they are. This is a classic example. There are others, many here, but this is a classic example because what was the outcome of this? Just then the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with this woman, but no one asked, why do, what do you want or why are you talking with her? They didn't seek what he needed or so on. They brought food and so on. Why are you, they didn't say, why are you talking with her? They just ignored it, I suppose. Nothing, there's no comment there. Then leaving her water jar, <laughs> she'd come for water, she left it there. She was in too much of a hurry. She went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. She was confessing. She was confident. She was excited. Could this be the Christ? Verse 29. They came out of the town and made their way toward him. What a witness. What an action. All because he offered her this living water, this eternal life. He didn't start talking about her past. He didn't start start moralizing he offered her as he offers all of us this living water which springs up to eternal life and what did she do she ran off and told them all this meanwhile the disciples urged him rabbi eat something but he said to them I have food to eat that you know nothing about then the disciples said to him, could someone have brought him food? <laughs> These are the disciples asking silly questions, really. They ought to have said, who was that woman? What, what, what was she about? Tell us about it. We thought, we thought you were talking to her. But they didn't. They rejected it because they were Jews. They were religious Jews. My food, they offered him food. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not, do you not say four months from now and the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. He's talking about the harvest of people, of course. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now the harvest, the crop, even now he has harvests the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. They, thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. I think this little episode is that he's telling them and guiding them into the what really in, in a way he's just witnessed to to this lady and their job is to go out and do likewise whether it's individuals or whether it's groups or whether it, whoever it is he's saying the harvest of people he doesn't say just Jews or Gentiles or whatever he says a harvest of people friends when we go around and we see groups today and we watch television and see massive groups of people they are the harvest the Lord wants. And we are the reapers. Others have sown before us. And uh, I guess there are people come and gone from even this sanctuary who have sown seeds. And uh, those seeds have had effect on others who come here now. And that's what the Lord is saying. I love the practicality of it of the gospel it's simple you have received take that to others and share it and we do that we can do that in many ways not just by preaching etc 
although that may occur in certain ways, of course, I'm sure it would, but always in the context of what the Lord says uh, as our attitude to other people. I have learned, I mean, I've been a Christian now for something like 45 years. I, thought I was always a Christian because I was brought up in that context. But I've learned a lot about other people, other, other, even other religions. It's not my job to criticise and judge. I do reflect, as often we hear from this pulpit, that there are things are amiss and you know, shouldn't be. That's quite right. We can't help ourselves. And I'm sure the Lord is not particularly concerned about our thoughts along those lines. But we do not judge people. We do not condemn people. We treat them as equals, human beings who have the opportunity or could have the opportunity of coming into his kingdom. That is a simple but a powerful statement that we carry around with us. Now, friends, it can be suddenly, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, whatever circumstances, good or not so good, that can happen because we've prayed, I hope, that God will lead us every day, wherever we are. Some days are just normal, easy going. Some have got problems, but the Lord is always there with us. You can feel him and sense him in our lives. So finally, friends, we hear the last few verses. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. That colourful background, that woman who was a little bit irksome and talked about religion and problems and raising things within this one day had, had cause to have many believing in him. She said, he told me everything I ever did. That's quite an interesting statement again. This again is the omniscience. There's three omnis, aren't there? Omni, omni-powerful, uh, om, omniscience, uh, omnipresent. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, omnipresent. And, but omni, omni, omniscience, he told me everything I ever did. He told me. She'd only just met him a few hours ago. And he told her everything he, she ever did. Friends, he knows everything I've done. He knows everything I've done and you've done. But he offers us. That's not an, that's not, that doesn't disqualify us. It can do, if we so will it. It can do but it qualifies us for eternal life because we believe and trust and take our confession. One thing I like about the liturgy here is the confession we have from time to time. I'm very happy about that. I don't wait for it to come here. I confess, of course, other times. But I, somehow I get a sense of I can't explain it, a sense of relief. And I, and I say, Lord, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to do it, but I'm, my thoughts, my words, my deeds. Now, friends, I'm not, a, I'm not a habitual sinner, if you like, but it's there. He came to call not the righteous, but the... But the... He didn't call to come to call the righteous he came to call the begins with S sinners thank you Lord that includes me but I have grown friends on a positive side if I've said too much about my sin I have grown, I have changed I'm nowhere anywhere near what I used to be like and I wasn't that bad 
paid for it. Yeah, you could always trust me. I was always truthful. I was always honest. I never stole. I never did anything wrong like that. I think once I did, <laughs> if I can just have a quick... St- when I was very, very young, the boys, you know, they, they said, oh, come on down, come down to the shops. And they said, if you put your hands through this, there was one of these things that come out from the shop. And if you put your hand through there, you can take something. I, I was only about seven or eight years old, I think. And I put my hand through and I felt something and I took it and ran off up the hills. And then I looked at it and it was a tin of salmon or something, a small one. <laughs> and I thought, I haven't got, what, you, what, what, what am I going to do with it? <laughs> This is just a story, for us. but it taught me something. I, I, I went home and I, I, I think I threw it. <laughs> but something in me, because I know if I forgot it, I stole for the first time, the last time, something, and it, it was worthless. What was the point of it? <laughs> Even then I had a little bit of <laughs> uh, credit, you know, character, if you like. But nevertheless, I stole it. I took it. It was no good to me. (laughs) But um, anyway, getting back to this, friends. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the saviour of the world hallelujah I'm, I'm sure through their uh, misinterpretation of uh, the Old Testament I'm sure that by this time with all that had got on, on happened they come into the kingdom as we Believers here today, I'm sure, are in the kingdom. I hope and pray that's true. I'm sure by your witness and my witness here today is that we are in the kingdom as we sing very often. And we rejoice as we sung earlier. Rejoice, friends, rejoice. Because the more you rejoice, the better your fit, your soul, your character will be along the lines of what God really wants. And uh, from that, he will give us opportunities in all sorts of ways, all sorts of ways. It could be the, oh, the, uh, the Good Samaritan, you know, that was this is an interesting item that G- Jesus to- told the, the Good Samaritan. Why did he pick a Samaritan when they were despised and rejected from Luke 10? Just very quickly, on one occasion, an expert in the law, that's a, probably a Pharisee, an expert, it was a high up guy in the religious uh, uh, Jewish religion, stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You ought to know, didn't you? What is written in the law, he, rep- he replied, Jesus, how do you read it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbour? Going to trip Jesus up, isn't he? Jesus answered, but he, but it, Sorry, uh, Jesus had answered. Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to say, to justify, who is my neighbor, he said. In reply, Jesus said, a man, a man, not a Jew, not a Gentile, not a good guy, not a bad guy, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell into the hands of robbers, they stripped him of clothes they, and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And three characters, I'll go through this fairly quickly, friends. Three characters came along. A priest, firstly. So Glynn's walking along there. (laughs) A priest, whoever it is, happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. They didn't want to know. So too, a Levite, 
Now, a Levite was uh, in charge of the sanctuary. He was an important person. He looked after all the fabric. He looked after all the detail. He looked after all the uh, money, etc. He looked after all the well-being of the sanctuary. He was an important man, looked up to, I guess, because he was in charge of the sanctuary. And bless him for it, and bless those who do look after sanctuaries. But what did he do? When he came to the place, he saw him and passed by on the other side. The third person was a Samaritan, just a Samaritan. And as he travelled along, he came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, poured on, on, poured on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have had. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? Jesus is replying who is to the man who's asked, who is my neighbour? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. What a wonderful, sh short but Wonderful when we analyse the difference between the people, the religious people, and the Samaritan who was hated, despised. But they didn't know him as an individual. We don't know people as individuals, what's gone on in their lives, what's gone, what their situation is. They might have been put off religion. They might be people who... Uh, couldn't care less or have had a bad experience. I once met a man and just walking out with the dog up the hills and somehow we got onto the subject. I, very, very, I just mentioned that I had a belief in God. Wow, that stirred him up. <laughs> I don't believe in fairies at the bottom of the garden. It went on and on and on. I said... <laughs> Most of what you said, I agree with. I don't believe in fairies at the bottom of the garden, and so on and so on. But he got—he was angry about religion. So we don't know, do we, friends? I managed to get a few words in with him, and uh, we parted reasonable, reasonable friends. But we don't know, and I learned a lesson from those sort of occasions. There's not many of them, but mostly people are, you know, friends. Just being friendly with people is a testimony to our respect and love. Part of love is respect. Just our respect for people. Just our welcoming. I, I notice on, you know, when we go to hol on holiday, we, we meet complete strangers. But sometimes we're sharing a, a restaurant or something or a, a lift or staircase or, good morning. People are short of social intercourse these days. And we can... We can be part of that. Good morning, lovely day, isn't it? Yes, oh yeah. I find people sometimes surprised that you're actually going to talk to them. But that's a beginning and a start. So we should also all practice. Good morning. <laughs> to, 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 to anybody. Sometimes people light up, sometimes they're... It doesn't matter. What matters is they've got a, a communication. Somebody cares enough to say, to share that the day is good. It's wonderful, friends. There's more power in that than walking by hurriedly as the three, as the two priests and Levite did. The bad guy, or supposedly, did everything possible. He was the one who Jesus applauded. Go and do likewise. Let's hope we can all do that. that as we travel along life's road. Any time, anywhere, any moment, it may be a prompting of the Lord that's saying, talk to this person, or be friendly with this person, acknowledge them, open the door for them, make space for them, stand back if they're in a hurry. 
those things are love. And I was going to go into that, but I haven't got, we haven't got time for that really. But love is the greatest gift we have. Faith, hope, faith, hope. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I'm fully known, 1 Corinthians 13, I'm sure you're aware of it. And now these things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Yeah. These three, these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. They are a, a fully known part of our faith. Our faith is faith in God, belief and faith and trust in him with the hope that he gives us for that. But without love, if I, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Love is our sword, if you like. Is our shield and our, our way of life. We should embrace, practice, because we know we all need it anyway as individuals. And he has given it to us, hasn't he? His love. His redeeming love. Thank you, friends. Amen.